Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you uh, for uh, being here on, on uh, the next part of the uh, Coordinator Day uh, budget hearings. Uh, I'm John Quincy, Chair of the Budget Committee, also joined by Council Vice President uh, Elizabeth Glidden, as well as uh, Council Member Cam Gordon. Um, so we represent the, the panel at the moment. I'm sure we'll be joined by other Council Members in a few moments. We don't need a, a quorum, so we're going to be able to continue on, on uh, time. Uh, so the first budget presentation we have today is the Civil Rights Department. We're going to be followed up with the uh, Youth Coordinating Board and the Municipal Building Commission this morning. And then we're going to be hearing from the Minneapolis uh, Park Board uh, this afternoon beginning at 1. So if we'd like to begin today, Ms. Corbel, wel welcome and uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Velma Corbel. I'm the d director in the Department of Civil Rights here to present the mayor's 2017 recommended budget for the department, which appears on pages F98 through F105 of the budget book. The next slide shows the department's organizational chart. There are five primary divisions, currently 25 authorized FD, FTEs. The five primary business units are complaint investigations, which is our traditional civil rights entity. The second is contract compliance division. The main work of the contract compliance division is equity and inclusion for minorities and women as workers and as businesses on publicly funded contracts. The third division is the civil rights equity division whose main work is the primary conduit to enterprise efforts on uh, racial and gender equity. And that division also administers uh, the Urban Scholars Internship Program. Fourth division is the Office of Police Conduct Review, whose main work is to handle complaints of misconduct filed against Minneapolis police officers. And finally, we have a, a new division uh, this year, the Labor Standards, Divi Labor Standards Enforcement Division, pardon me. And their uh, main work is to implement and enforce the new safe and six time ordinance that was passed back in the spring of 2016. <laughs> you will also note that there are some um, boxes that seem to be floating alone by themselves. One is the um, Minneapolis Commission on Civil Rights, the Police Conduct Oversight Commission, and the Police Conduct Review Panel, along with a new um, board that the Civil Rights Department would be staffing, the Workplace Advisory Committee, these are uh, community uh, member represented boards. The Minneapolis Commission on Civil Rights is 21, 21 members. The Police Conduct Oversight Commission is uh, seven, seven members. The Police Conduct Review Panel are actually seven representatives appointed by the mayor and city council, uh, two at a time of which are uh, part of the uh, sworn slash civilian review panel model. And then the new Workplace Advisory Committee is a 16-member group that we are currently in the process of uh, recruiting so that that group can be appointed by Mayor Hodges and the City Council to be ready to go to work in 2017. And I would make an appeal uh, at this point, while my mind is on it, that we are uh, still looking for members of the Workplace Advisory Committee, especially for uh, mid to large business representatives. There are two seats and small and independent businesses. There are two seats for which we are currently recruiting. So I'll make that appeal in case anybody is watching this or the, or the, re, um, the rebroadcast. The next page is the summary of the 2017 request. If, uh, you will notice uh, sort of mid, midway through the slide, bottom of the page, uh, $3,761,086 request in 2017 from the general fund. $362,644 of other funds for a total budget of $4,123,730. This is a, an approximate 12% increase over 2016. You will also note on the slide that there are some 
some change items or some new requests going forward in 2017, $88,000 in the co contract compliance division that would be for certification specialists. We'll talk about that in more detail as we get to the operating division slides. $100,000 for the Office of Police Conduct Review for a case investigator. Uh, both those two amounts, the 88K and the $100,000 are ongoing and $50,000 uh, for a labor standards enforcement outreach to engage with the public on the implementation of the new sick and safe time ordinance. And that's a one-time expense. It is a one-time. Thank you. That 50000 is one-time. <clears throat> As we move to our uh, core programs, the first I'll uh, provide a bit more detail about, again, is the Complaint Investigations Division. That division does uh, its work primarily with uh, its five full-time equivalent staff. That division handles a variety of civil rights cases, but uh, the majority of its work is through a work share agreement with the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. The department is, um, has a goal of completing 58 cases that would be done under that contract with the um, uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission next year, and we do get a reimbursement for case handling that we do under that work share agreement of uh, $700, I believe. The, this division has some uh, pretty, uh, some key work that is ongoing, which you see at the bottom of the slide, I won't read everything, but in, in addition to handling complaints of discrimination and overseeing the, um, the uh, work share agreement with the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, this is the <laughs> division that also staffs the Commission on Civil Rights. So that uh, creates a different body of work but I also want to highlight some upcoming work that this division will be doing in 2017 that these resources that have been requested would, will be paying for in addition to its normal everyday work is the division will be uh, focusing on uh, a project around uh, non-discrimination in public accommodations. We came to the council about three weeks ago, I believe, to get that work approved and um, to get the word out about that. And then there the division is also doing work related to fair housing under the direction of um, uh, Danielle Shelton Volchek, who is the division director. The Complaint Investigations Division summary of funding is on the next slide, and you will note there that it is doing its uh, work with the five FTEs that I mentioned, but they also uh, fund a share of the administrative staff, which is the director, a project coordinator, and the executive assistant. In terms of some performance measures that we have highlighted in the Complaint Investigations Division, I thought I would share case inventory that is um, shows a comparison from 2012 through the third quarter of 2016, moving left to right. And also I would um, like to highlight the work of the alternative dispute resolution that's ongoing in the, in the division as of third quarter 2016. And I won't have the exact dollar amount of the, um, of the re monies recovered through our alternative dispute resolution until we have uh, recalculated those numbers. But uh, based on the last report we did, we were up about 300% of resources recovered for charging parties in, um, in mediations. So uh, hats off to the staff conducting the mediation work in that division. The next division I'll, I'll talk about in greater detail is the Contract Compliance Division. I talked about the equity work that the equity and inclusion work that the division is, uh, do, does on an ongoing basis. But in addition to that, the department also recovers lost wages for uh, workers on city construction contracts. And uh, I had the number in my head, I didn't write it down, but I believe over the last three quarters, they recovered about $50,000 in lost wages. And this happens when contractors are either misclassifying workers or just not paying workers what they're supposed to be paid on public contracts. And the Contract Compliance Division is um, monitoring and making sure that those employees are recovering the wages that um, 
would be stolen otherwise. The division uh, does its work with nine FTEs plus their share again of the administrative staff. Contract compliance is requesting an additional staff in 2017. The, um, that request has been forwarded through the mayor's budget of a certification specialist to the tune of about $88,000. And I'll talk about that more when we get to the, the um, resources slide. But I wanted to highlight work that the division will be doing in 2017 in addition to the disparity study that we've talked about a few times in front of the council, which will be done and uh, slated to be done in January of 2018. That division is also undertaking work to upgrade its compliant management system instead of doing work with the Excel spreadsheet and the CRM and other um, software systems that we're using right now to do compliance. We're actually going to have a new compliance management system. I'll talk about that a little bit when we get to the uh, capital asset request slide. But the division is also a partner in developing a business resource matrix, which should be available to help small businesses gain access to a variety of resources, not just in our community planning and economic development division, but with our partners across the region, like the Met Council, City of St. Paul, and the county. And on the resource slide, again, you will note that the, um, the contract compliance request for an additional staff is shown under the, the FTEs would increase by one. There are also some federal funds in addition to the general fund request, which is a community development block grant funding that the division receives on an annual and ongoing basis. This number, um, I believe, in, in uh, previous years, this, this number in the non-general fund column has decreased as the budget deliberations have been ongoing, but we always start out at this amount, and so this year, again, starting out at three, uh, approximately 321,000. And the next slide describes the change item for the certification specialist, and I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about why we need this position. The certification specialist will do exactly what the name implies will be certifying. Uh, it'll be a certifying member of the Minnesota Uni Unified Certification Program. A certification in this regard is a little bit like doing a complaint investigation because some folks would think that to certify a person, a business would submit an application, it gets reviewed, the box gets checked, it goes into a small business directory, but it's a little bit more involved in that. The, um, the certification specialist will be analyzing the social and economic status of a business in order to determine it to be eligible to participate in our small and underutilized business program. So that individual, when he or she is on board, will be doing um, analyzing business, organizational documents, financial uh, documents, analyzing subject matter expertise of the owner to determine the economic, um, economic status, but also whether or not a business is legitimately controlled by a disadvantaged individual. So there's a little bit more to it than checking the box. And so the staff person will be able to um, assist us with fulfilling our obligation as a member of the Minnesota Unified Certification Collaborative. Some performance data on the next slide um, relative to the uh, contract compliance division, we're showing um, inclusion performance for businesses on the slide to the left and inclusion performance for workforce on the slide to the right. And we are tracking a little bit under at the end of the third quarter, but there is a, a logical reason for that. And we talked about this last year when we talked about the third quarter report for uh, contract compliance. You know, about two years ago, the government was really the only only person building uh, construction projects during the recession. Fortunately, that's picked up a little bit, but it's also created competition for the small women-owned and minority-owned firms, uh, which is a good thing for women and minority-owned firms, but it's also really stretched the capacity of the existing small and minority-owned businesses to do work across a myriad of publicly funded projects. And so the, the chore here now, or the task, is to identify other businesses in the community to get them certified to be able to participate on publicly funded contracts in the city and with our other government partners. 
in the Office of Police Conduct Review. Excuse me, real yes. quickly, Director Corbell, I just wanted to check in uh, with my colleagues up here. We've, of course, been joined by Councilmember Bender and Fry. Just wanted to make sure there weren't any questions before you went on to the next slide. Not seeing any, please, if you could continue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The next division we'll talk about in detail is the Office of Police Conduct Review. And I think it goes without saying that the Office of Police Conduct Review staff has been earning its uh, paychecks over the last several months. And they um, will continue to do work that um, is allowing greater access and transparency to data, uh, to police data. They will continue to analyze trends to determine which programs and activities may need to be studied to create better transparency and efficiency. And I am really pleased to say that after a couple of years of making the request, an additional FTE is in this 2017 budget for an additional case investigator. And that's shown on uh, the next slide. Uh, at $100,000 for that case investigator to do uh, really an increased amount of work that would also free up existing staff time to really focus on the work of the Police Conduct Oversight Commission, which is the community-facing component of the Office of Police Conduct Review, which is the, the group that you hear about that's doing the uh, complaint process analysis or the body camera study and all of the other good work that uh, you hear that that group is undertaking. And uh, so the resource slide shows the additional FTE and the, um, the total resources requested for the division. And the next slide uh, shows some performance, performance data. Thank you for, uh, I'm, I'm going fast. And please, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I know I'm going fast. I want to get through it and yeah, also leave time for questions. If, there are any. if I'm talking too fast, please let me know. Doing fine. Thank you. The Office of Police Conduct Review performance data uh, through the third quarter of 2016 appears on the next couple of slides. And uh, we are showing uh, the complaints filed by quarter and allegations um, filed over the last uh, couple of years. And I actually chatted a little bit with the police conduct staff because if you'll notice here in the, in the, um, the Q3 comparison slides, which are about two thirds of the way over on the left graphic, why is it that it appears that the complaints filed in the third quarter of 2016 looks like it's a little bit lower? And it really is a factor of timing. And uh, by the end of 2016, the complaint load will actually have risen overall from 2015, but it's cyclical. They're, the complaints spike in the summer and they taper off a little bit in the cooler months. But um, the complaints overall do show uh, an is increase from 2015. And the next slide for the Office of Police Conduct Review shows uh, uh, intake resolutions and review panel recommendations on the allegations, which uh, pretty much tracks with um, the data from the previous slide. And I do want to point out that all of this information in uh, the Contract Compliance Division, Complaint Investigations Division, Office of Police Conduct Review, all of this performance data is updated quarterly and is available on the department's website for folks who are interested. Uh, but again, the um, department will continue to, or the division will continue to analyze the trends to determine which policies and programs and areas will be studied to improve outcomes and also the relationships. And I stop there and, and make two points. Um, I, I think it is, it would be remiss if I didn't pause to really talk about the partnerships that the div division has created, especially with the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, we don't always agree with what goes on in the Minneapolis Police Department, but um, it really is a testament, I think, to the relationship that the staff in the division has created with the Internal Affairs Division, that they're able to continue to do such good work. And I think um, that the work that they will do going forward to make sure that the division continues to have access to data and information by which to make the recommendations back to the City Council in order to improve police community relations 
is extremely important. And so I want to thank the Minneapolis Police Department, also the Office of the City Attorney, but especially the, the staff. And the other thing that I would like to point out while I'm taking this commercial break is that the, the, the staffs in the Contract Compliance Division, the Office of Police Conduct Review, and the Complaint Investigations Division, and the Civil Rights Equity Division have really leveraged the relationships and the networks that they bring to their jobs. They don't just stop working at 5 o'clock when they leave the city because their personal relationships they leverage to be able to help fulfill the obligations of, um, of, the, of the division. And, uh, you know, uh, we've got two attorneys in the department who leverage their, their legal networks to identify work that we can be doing in the Civil Rights Department. Manny Jafar, who runs the Office of Police Conduct Review, just told me this morning that she's leveraged a relationship that she brought to the department to um, work to produce an hour-long Twin Cities public television uh, show that will be broadcast that talks about police community relations and uh, police civilian police oversight. And so I'm um, just really, uh, really pleased about that and impressed that she was able to do that so quickly. And then our, the fair housing work. Excuse me, Director yes. Corbel. Yes. Uh, Council Vice President. Wait till she's back. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. We didn't mean to pause you. Keep going. Okay. Uh, Dirk, uh, Council Member Glidden did have a question when you're when you're finished. Okay. Very good. The, the civil rights yeah. equity oh, division. Okay. Oh, yeah. Now okay. So now I'm going to pause. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. I just didn't mean to interrupt you in the I middle of your okay. your right comments. Time. So if you could go back to the prior slide, I had a question on this. Uh, which oh, prior slide? Right there. Yep. On the data slide. The data slide. Right. So um, just noticing that, um, so I guess one question on the data slide is that mediation um, seems to be a pretty minimal portion of kind of what's happening with the cases. And I wondered if um, you could get any comment on why you think that is. Um, I mean, I noticed too, there's kind of a high number of no jurisdiction and dismissal, so maybe that's a reason, but. Member Glidden, I can answer that question for you. Imani Jafar, Director of the Office of Police Conduct Review. So I'll start with the no jurisdiction. So we only have jurisdiction over the Minneapolis Police Department. So as you can imagine, with several law enforcement agencies in the area, we get a fair bit of complaints uh, involving park police, metro transit. So those have to be dismissed right away. We even get complaints about incidents that happen in other <laughs> states. So we tried to separate out the no jurisdiction so that people could see how big of a number that is. Those complaints still have to be processed. So intake investigator still does a full analysis. We sit down jointly. That's myself and commander of internal affairs to make that decision. As far as mediation, um, that's an option that we tend to try and use when it's a good fit for both the complainant and the officer. So our first step is usually to ask the complainant, uh, you know, are you interested in sitting down to talk with the officer? Cases that present themselves that way are sometimes when they say, maybe an officer referenced them in a way that was offensive to them because of a disability or something like that. And so uh, we'll say, and when they say, I want an apology, I just want to talk to them, those tend to be cases for mediation. A lot of time complainants would prefer not to talk to the officer, and so we certainly wouldn't push someone into that. So we really try and gauge what's a good fit for mediation. I think it's an excellent resolution when the complainant really wants to participate and wants to speak to the officer about the incident. But otherwise, some, sometimes in those incidents, because they tend to be lower level issues, uh, coaching is more appropriate so that that would be the officer talking to their supervisor through performance mentoring, and then they would have they have documentation that they then have to return to us, and we have to approve that. Okay, all right. Thank you. Good. So moving on to the Civil Rights Equity Division. I mentioned that this division is our uh, conduit with the uh, enterprise equity work and oversees the Urban Scholar Program. And what, um, what I think has been really uh, notable in this division and will be uh, work going forward is to continue to grow the partners in the community to be able to uh, leverage and expand the Urban Scholars Program. So relationships with um, the uh, technical college in town or with other educational institutions, consultant organizations to be able to provide 
the leadership develop and development and training to the urban scholars, but also to create that meaningful work experience for them is something that this division has um, really put at the forefront of, of its work. And I would pause here to say that, you know, five years ago when we started the Urban Scholar Program, I don't think people thought it would, 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 would last as long as it did, but it's, um, it has. And I think that is in large part due to the council and the mayor's continued support of the program and all the partners across the, the city that um, host Urban Scholars every summer. So I want to say thanks for that. And the other thing that I would say is that there, um, there is a perception that somehow Urban Scholars is competition for other internship programs that exist inside the city. But I don't believe that because I think there's space for all of these programs if they are planned and administered thoughtfully and strategically. And um, we plan to build on the success of Urban Scholars going forward. We have the resources and the budget to continue to do that. We've also leveraged, we think, the right partnerships to be able to grow at a pace that makes sense for this program. And uh, I would uh, applaud um, Cassidy Gardner, who has taken over that program in the last year and ha is really doing a, a nice job with that. Ms. Garbo, yes. I uh, wanted to pause for a second and say we've been joined by Council Members Paul Masano, uh, Johnson, uh, Goodman, and uh, Cano. Uh, but we also have a question uh, from Council Vice President Glidden. Thanks. I just had kind of two pieces on this um, work in the equity division with the urban scholars. One was, I don't know how you're working with the enterprise on the goals for for the program and how it continues to, to grow, but I will just kind of put in a pitch that I hope we can grow into this kind of some more specific goals around seeing the urban scholars retain permanent employment with the, it's not just a city, although I think, you know, we would really benefit in the city from that partnership, but also from the other jurisdictional partners. And so that's one piece I'll say from my uh, perspective. The second thing is I'm actually kind of, well, let me just ask it this way, um, is whether there are other entities that are interested either in starting their version of an urban scholars program or something else. I mean, just at some point, I wonder if we become more the partner to a, a bigger effort mm -hmm. as opposed to ourselves. I mean, we've kind of piloted it, we've grown it, we've shown this is a very successful model that can still have room to grow and how mm -hmm. it kind of becomes a, a way to excite um, participants to what it might mean to work in the public sector. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about that too. I, I would invite Ms. Gardner to come up and, and talk a little bit about some of the work that she's doing in the strategic planning with the partners. But I just wanted to say in the Civil Rights Department, I know there are other departments in the city that have hired urban scholars on a permanent basis. We've actually hired eight inside mm -hmm. the Civil Rights Department. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of work. Uh, when you do that, but uh, I think very, uh, very exciting and very rewarding. And so I'll just ask Ms. Uh, Ms. Gardner to come. Ms. Gardner, welcome. Mr. Chair, Vice President Glidden, um, I'm, we'll start with your first question. Um, we uh, had limited space and limited um, uh, ability to include all of our data. I will say that for your information, um, up until 2015 uh, of Q2, 30% of the scholars who have come through our program here at the city have gained full-time or part-time employment after their internship. So we're very proud of that. Um, data nationally with public institutions uh, at the federal level is about 7%. Um, we are, will always strive to be closer to our private sector um, friends, which is about 70% retention after putting and investing in those interns. Um, we are currently in the process of trying to collect that data from our partners due to data practicing uh, practices, laws, et cetera, it's hard to collect that information. Um, our friends over at Step Up have similar issues with collecting data from alumni, um, but we're working on creating mechanisms by which to track what happens to our scholars after we invest in them and after they graduate. Um, as to your second question, we are working on a model that would allow other institutions to pick up um, and start their own program. Um, we currently, as a leader in this, have the resources 
in which we're able to do evidence-based practices. We're able to look at whether or not our programs and the kind of the nuances to what we're doing with our students are uh, resulting in long-term employment. Um, some of the challenges that we're facing are that certain institutions will never grow to the size that the city is. Um, and so we, we are trying to help build relationships between those organizations. So for example, the parks, the schools, and United Way, they will never have the capacity to host 30 scholars, but we know that our program is more than just uh, 40 hours of work. We have a cohort model and training within a group of 15 to 30 students is really important. Um, and so we're trying to create a curriculum. Um, and at this year, uh, my staff and I are figuring ways in which we can either sell this curriculum, um, but that we can be more of a support um, or administration versus um, running the program for all of our partner agencies. Thank you. Thanks very much. Councilmember Fry. Actually, this, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This yeah. question is for Ms. Gardner. Thank you, Ms. Corbell, for your presentation. Um, the statistics that you, you just uh, gave off, so that you said, I just want to make sure I had them right. It was 30% uh, retention rate for the city of Minneapolis, which I find very impressive. Um, and then you said it was 70% retention for the private sector. Nation, is, it, is that nationwide? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Fry, that is correct. And that's nationwide regardless of what program it is. That's just interns in general. Yes. Uh, those are some excellent numbers. I really appreciate your work. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Corbel, or welcome back. Um, I just wanted to point out that if you could be a little conscious of time, but we're doing fine. I, I will just move on to uh, the Labor Standards Division. Um, I, I think um, the data and information that Ms. Gardner discussed for the Civil Rights Equity Division would uh, appear in a narrative form in the slides, but I think she just did a terrific job explaining that. So Labor Standards Enforcement is a new division this year. Um, the resources for labor standards actually appeared in the budget for the Office of the City Coordinator in 2000, in the 2016 budget, but they will appear in the Civil Rights Department budget in 2017. And as I mentioned, this is the division that is tasked with implementing and enforcing the uh, new sick and safe time ordinance. That um, division has a change item in it that shows in the next slide that is a one-time uh, dollar amount of $50,000 that is uh, proposed, and that is to continue to uh, engage and outreach to um, communities to make sure that employers understand their obligations under this law and employees understand their rights uh, under this law as well. Uh, two FTEs in the division uh, that will be sustained in 2017 and again, a graphic depiction of the narrative in the previous slide. The graphics on performance, just as um, since about the 1st of June through the end of September, 